We are going to discuss a pretty depressing topic, which is how people in the video game industry work together, in what kind of culture, and how it affects their lives, their happiness, and the kind of game they produce as a result. Julien Arnard, who was kind enough to invite me here, wanted me to give a positive and inspiring speech. So I'm going to step out a little of what my usual stance on that kind of topic is, which is one of a reporter, uh, to try and give you some pieces of advice. But I have to make it clear that I have absolutely no skill in that field whatsoever. Hence the first use of terrible in the title of this talk. Let me introduce myself real quick. My name is Cécile Fléchon and I've worked for a French PC gaming magazine that some of you may know, Canard PC. I worked there for over eight years and I signed my articles with a very witty pen name, Maria Kalash. If you feel like insulting me, you can find me on Twitter, at KamaSS. I will mute you in a second, don't worry. So, during those eight years as a columnist, I reviewed quite a lot of video games, and I did so very unfairly, to be honest. I also took part in writing many features articles about sexism in the industry, racism in video games, censorship and self-censorship, the birth of a trade union, and during the very last year with Sébastien Netzabes de Laye, uh, Yvan Le Fou and two journalists from the investigative website Mediapart, we interviewed dozens of video game professionals for a series of articles we called Crunch Investigation. Developers, PR persons, freelancers, game designers, producers, artists, sound designers, CEOs, CTOs in France, in the UK, in Japan, in Canada, some with very typical indie background, others in huge corporations. We also read our share of scientific articles on these matters. Game study scholars have produced a very interesting corpus of texts. So I'm not going to tell you that we know exactly how things work everywhere, but we've got a pretty good idea. And the solutions I'm going to talk about are also the result of this investigative work. For instance, I know that most people in this room have dreamt of working in video games. As kids, we played them. We grew up dreaming of working with them. And some of us wanted to make them, others wanted to write about them, others longed to think about them. Some might be willing to try and sell them. That's a fact. Many of you in this room have made your childhood dream come true. Some of you are game developers, artists, games sco maybe scholars in game studies, video games journalists. Congrats. How great is that? Isn't that awesome that so many of you guys and girls have managed to do what you dreamt of doing for so long? Isn't it worth accepting a few concessions? Oh, just a few. For instance, a low salary. It is a secret for no one here that there is a huge salary gap between the video game industry and some neighboring fields. The most blatant example of that is in programming, since nowadays, Programmers can find work pretty much wherever they want. A young IT engineer who applies to a bank can make twice as much as their fellow young engineer who applies for a job in a game studio. Sure, lots of studios cannot offer the same retribution as a huge corporation, but some could make the effort, and still they don't. What they offer instead is a symbolic retribution the pleasure of working in a field the candidate feels passionate about. Sure, I mean, we all want a fulfilling life. We get it. We don't need to be rich. Actually, no one needs to, but that's another topic. Well, science shows that though money does not make people happy, there is still a threshold under which that's not completely true. And guess what? Most video game workers do not make it to the threshold. But this very point, passion, is going to be the answer to every claim the employees make. What? You're not happy with your job here. Maybe you are not as passionate as you should be. Maybe you should go and work for an insurance company. We'll see how much you like that. But better than that, passion is so deeply rooted in every video game worker. It is something that they have heard so many times, starting from school, that most of the time, the employers do not even need to pressure their employees into accepting the unacceptable. In a way, it is understandable. 
They are 23 or 24, it is their first job, they have just opened the door onto their dream. And they want to matter. They want their work to have an impact. So they stay late at night to make sure that what they are supposed to do is really polished and that it is not going to be cut from the final game. And they keep doing it. We've heard that many times. Yeah, it's worth working unpaid over time, you know? I just want to make sure that this thing I'm working on ends up being perfect. And I'm a beginner. I'm not efficient. I spend more time on my task. It's normal. But after a while, they keep doing it, even though they are now skilled and efficient. And the newbies who arrived in the company, they see these older workers staying late, and they are just as passionate as them. So they, they work long hours too because it's about peer pressure too, about some kind of company culture. Of course, the job market in the video game industry is tough. Many applicants, few vacating spots. So everyone wants to show they are eager to work. But it sometimes gets ridiculous. And during the tougher time of the production, before milestone, everyone rushes a bit, works extra longer, but among the dozens of workers we have interviewed, some told us that oftentimes they would stay at work even though they had had their task accomplished. Why would they do that? Because they are passionate and insecure about their jobs, and it is in the company culture to stay late. So, they have a shitty salary, they are insecure about their jobs, they work long hours, but they are still passionate. It's still a dream job, yay! Isn't a dream job worth coping with your boss's sexist or racist attitude? What we have heard about some French bosses is appalling, but nearly no one ever questions it. It's understandable. The employees are not sure they could get another job, and they rationalize by thinking that this lewd CEO means no harm. It's just his way of joking, you know. And unfortunately, when people do speak up, it can get ugly. And unfortunately, the boss's attitude often sets an example for the whole team, or at least those who are eager to fit in. So let me say it right now, no, it is not worth it. Sure, it is your dream job, we have already said it too many times, but it is your real life too. And you won't get a second one to try and make it better. And I want to emphasize this, in real life, there is no extra life. And what happens is that people love their jobs, work extra hard for it, accept shitty salary, turn a blind eye on their coworkers' crappy views or behaviors. And what happens next? Sooner or later, they end up quitting the industry. Most have left before they reach their 35th birthday. The 2018 GDC State of the Industry survey shows that the, the average career in video game is three to six years long. Okay? Most professional game workers spend three to five years getting trained for a career, and they quit after three to six years. I don't have to tell you this is a catastrophe, a disaster. For the industry as a whole, it means that loads of skilled professionals just vanish into thin air. And they quit precisely when they have the experience needed to help their younger co-workers, when they should be given creative responsibilities, when they have invested a lot of time and resources into becoming super good. It means that the video game industry is deprived of its best workers because they are exhausted. For individuals, it is a fun, tough decision made because life has become unbearable. No time to spend with their loved ones if they are lucky enough to have found someone special. And if that someone special has not yet decided to leave because they were tired of never seeing their significant other. I've experienced that, you know, and being dumped at 34 because you were busy getting burnt out at work is no fun. So they have no time to spend with their families and friends, no time to take care of themselves, no time to read, no energy to go to the picture or to do charity work, no time to do anything besides working. Job insecurity, not knowing where you will be, where, where you will be working next year or the following, the feeling of uselessness 
when 80 or 90 percent of your work is not making it into the final game. It is very difficult, very painful for someone to give up on their dreams. One of the features of the video game industry is that lines are blurred between work and leisure. In our understanding of the way they treat their workers, it is one of the core mechanism, one of the core mechanisms at work in crushing their employees. Paired with the functioning on the of two-year, three-year, four-year long projects, it creates a lot of insecurity. You don't need to emphasize that it makes an explosive cocktail. Something I want to add though is that some of the issues raised may be related to a capitalistic work organization, but not all of them are. In France, we have some video game companies that have tried models, which differ from the usual company with bosses on top and employees on the, at the bottom. This company, which are flatter in hierarchy, still have to deal with the same problems of blurred line between work and leisure and a very high level of commitment expected from everyone. It does not change the fact either that the games are published in a competitive capitalist industry. I don't want to dismiss their efforts, that's not my point, because they are trying hard, but keep in mind that it is not a panacea. So, now that we know how terrible things are, we're going to have a look at how to make them less terrible. So let me apologize if you thought that from now on, now on I would be only saying nice and positive things. I have to dig deeper into some issues to make the solutions understandable. So this talk will keep being terrible and depressing, sorry. But whether you are a worker or a boss, there are things that you can do to make things better for yourself and for your co-workers and the industry as a whole. Even if you are perfectly happy with your job and do not recognize your own situation at all in what I've described so far, I know many of you are, and that is great, you can still make things better for the others. The first thing would be unionize. Meet people who have the same problem as you do and fight together. There is a talk later this afternoon with two members of the Syndicat des Travailleurs du Jeu Vidéo, the STGV, the French Game Worker Union. Go and listen to them, meet them, build with them. If you hate unions, I don't know, maybe some of you do, there are other ways of joining forces. All of them imply that you are going to talk with people with the same set of problems as you. Don't hesitate to do it. If you work for a bigger company, your bosses do it. In France, we have the Syndicat National des Éditeurs de Jeux Vidéo, no, the Syndicat National des Jeux Vidéo, and the Syndicat des Éditeurs de Logiciels de Loisirs. I'm sure that every other European country has an equivalent. That's how they get political leverage and tax cuts. So do it too. If you don't, you won't get anything. Then, and it's relevant even if you do not work, in the video game industry, go and listen to some hearings at a labor court, employment tribunal, conseil de prud'homme, or whatever it's called in your country. Having an idea of how things can go ugly in one's job, of what can be used as a proof of your good or bad faith, and how judges actually decide how to make things straight is an eye-opener. It really is. And I'm deeply convinced that most issues between employers and employees are not the result of any male violence from one of the parts. Often, they are the result of misunderstandings, poor knowledge of rights and duties in the context of labor. And that's very, very true in the video game industry. And also a lack of reaction when the issues are brought up. So it's totally worth spending one afternoon listening to other people and other company problems. Do it. Let's jump to when the problems start. When the small team project starts to hire. Actually, for the company, given the employment market, it's usually not much of a problem. So many people want to work in video games, it's nuts. If you want an experienced worker, though, that's when the difficulty starts. As we said earlier, the first problem here is demographics. Skilled workers have either switched careers or funded, or funded their own studios. And there is nothing you can do about it. I have no solution. The only lead here would be to try and raise the standards. 
if you raise the standards of working in the industry and share it with your powers in the union of the group or the group of workers you've created just five minutes ago, you might help make things better for the whole game workers community. And you may help hold back the skilled workers. In the meantime, for many video game workers, reality is bleak. A daily routine of hard work, short nights, junk food, no leisure, no sports, and the constant idea that they are easily replaceable. And it keeps going until exhaustion, until a sick leave or a career transition. And you have to keep in mind that it is even worse for some people, women racially diverse people, people who belong to a sexual minority, people with disabilities or chronic illnesses. All of this has a very depressing consequence. Video game studios are filled with young white dudes. There is nothing wrong with being a young white dude. I know many great humans who happen to be young white dudes. But as creators, humans tend to do things that are aimed at people who are very similar to them. So many video games are developed for young white youths, obliterating a huge part of their potential buyers, players, and they are limiting their creativity. Production culture affects which game are developed, who develop them, and who plays them. Why do I say that? Because I want to emphasize that production culture is where your efforts should be aimed. So let's get back to our studios filled with young white youths. There are several mechanisms at work here. First, few women, few non-white people, few people from sexual minorities, few people with disabilities or chronic illnesses apply to these positions. Often we read or hear employers saying, hmm, every candidate for this position is white youth. I can't do anything about it. It's both true and false. You can't coerce women, for instance, into applying for your position. You can't coerce them into studying in the field uh, that you need, let's say programming. No, you are not going to fix that. If you were to recruit someone, it is inevitable that you will have a lot more men applying, whatever you do. But you can, and I think you should, that you are grown-ups and you do whatever you want within the boundaries of the law. You can encourage more women to apply more people from a diverse background. How? How can you do that? Well, the answer is so simple you are going to laugh. Just say it. The European Parliament has... You actually did not laugh at all, so I'm really disappointed. The European Parliament has issued a guide about best practice in gender equality. And one of the first points is that when writing your job advertisement, specify the policy on equal opportunities women will feel encouraged to apply. And it is astonishing, but it works. I'm going to support this with a very personal example. Forgive me. As some of you may know, I practice Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which is a very male-dominated sport. Some would say it's a sausage fest. With still a lot of misogyny about how weak women are and how poor partners they are in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, how they should stick to dancing or Zumba and so on. And before I took my first class, I googled the gyms in my area. And guess where I went? To the only gym that offered women a reduced entrance fee. It was not about the money. Well, it was a bit about the money. I was a video game journalist, after all. But it was mostly about feeling welcome. Contrary to my jiu-jitsu gym, which had decided to make a bit less money on my fees, most of the time it cost you nothing, zero, to tell people who usually feel threatened or not legit that you are open to meeting them and to hiring them. But, of course, recruiting people is not enough you also have to be able to keep them. For instance, with women in tech, it's not limited to video games, it's something that has been studied in the STEM field. There is a well-known phenomenon called the leaky pipeline. It's a metaphor. It's used to describe the fact that women are underrepresented in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics careers. The idea is that the pipeline carrying students from secondary school through university and onto a job in STEM and ultimately a leading position has leaks, holes, 
through which women magically vanish. Well, actually, they do not vanish. They are excluded. It's not a conscious effort. No one ever says or thinks, hey, let's push the women out of the company. But that is what the, organi the organization of work does. How come? Women are usually more qualified. Let me remind you that most women apply only when they have the whole required skill set, while men tend to apply as soon as they have about half of it. So there are several explanations here. But before the first explanation, I'm going to drink a little bit. I'm thirsty, sorry. So, first explanation is culture. There is a great article by a guy named Robin S. Johnson titled Toward Greater Production Diversity Examining Social Boundaries at a Video Game Studio. It does a great job at explaining how the organization of work can exclude women. Robin Johnson studied a mid-sized US studio for a while. In this 75-person studio, there is a ritual called Beer Friday. It's an informal meeting during which employees gather, they drink beers and they play Magic the Gathering and some video games. It's all fun, informal and friendly. But people still talk about work, about the industry. They, <coughs> they share valuable knowledge and bond and think of things that might be implemented in their productions later. But what happens? Female employees would will not join the crowd. Some of them because they have never been explicitly invited, others because they feel intimidated, or because beer consuming is culturally encoded as something for men. And because of that, Beer Friday tends to exclude women from full professional development in the company. It is true for women, but the same reasoning would apply for, let's say, a Muslim coworker, a former alcoholic who needs to stay away from the bottle, or someone whose medication is incompatible with alcohol consumption. So there is no malevolence, but it is still an excluding process. There is much more to this article, but it's 20 pages long and I cannot go into details. I would strongly advise you to read it. I have a copy here. If someone wants to borrow it, I can I happily share. And you might want to think about how all the informal times happening at your workplace might actually be sometimes excluding some of your coworkers. Horizontal structure is also an issue. It seems counterintuitive, but it has been shown that flatter, more informal work organizations, such as the one we often use in the industry, tend to hinder women's advancement. Why? Women are taught much more than men, to stay in their places. An informal route, informal route into management or into a senior position is usually through visibility to existing management. And you don't become visible to management when you have been taught that you should not get noticed. Gender segregation, horizontal and vertical, you know, the glass ceiling, do not help, but you all know about that already. Poor work-life balance. It's taxing on everybody, but it is especially on women. We are still expected to be the primary caregiver at home, and a job that turns into 10-hour workdays is a strong deterrent. If you manage to lessen crunch issues, you may retain more women and improve everyone's lives. And last, the lack of role models. I think it's very telling that uh, when we interviewed game workers for our investigation, we had several accounts of women being sexually harassed at work. Most of them did not dare to speak up, fearing that they would be ostracized as a result, so they kept quiet. Nearly all of the women who did report the problems to the hierarchy were working in studios where there was a woman among the managers. So I will end this terrible talk with a few terribly obvious and naive piece of pieces of advice. But first, next slide. When you are promoted to a management position, first, congrats. Second, please seek training. 
poor management is the root of many, many problems in the industry. And poor management is not always the result of a lack of training, but that's probably its most prominent source. And it's easily fixable. And there is no shame in that. It's a skill to be able to criticize someone's work constructively. It's a skill to be able to lead a meeting. It's a skill to know how and when to delegate. You would not hire a programmer who has not learned how to code. So why is it okay to just pick someone out of a team and tell them, now you're manager? Which is what happens most of the time without ever giving them the tools to act effectively as such. I, I'm not a big fan of managementalism, if it's even a word, but you know, meeting, process, lean thinking, deming, six sigma, blah, blah, blah. it sounds boring and tedious and sometimes invasive. But a video game company is that, a company where people come to work to earn a living because they have to. You are developing video games. It is going to be fun and interesting sometimes, but do not, billing, do not believe that being oblivious of organization is going to make things more fun and more interesting and more punk. Chances are it's going to make things messy. You are going to waste everyone's work, time and energy. And those of your coworkers who are the most invested are also the ones who are the most fragile. Fragile, fragile, je sais pas. And they are going to suffer from it. Be nice to people. If you notice someone at work seems a bit off, ask them about it. Not in the middle in the office. Do it in the break room with no one else to listen. The same goes if you have critics about someone's work. You don't tell them in front of everyone in the, in the office. It is extremely humiliating. It seems obvious, but the number of times we've heard of developers' work being demolished in public is appalling, whether it was by a superior or by a coworker. Be careful when you joke. The industry is all about being laid back, and we are more than just coworkers. We are a bunch of friends, and even better, we are family. So we joke together. The thing is, you are not a bunch of friends or family. You are at work. If my cousin or my buddy is being a dick, I can tell them to go fuck themselves and leave the table. If someone is being a dick at work, I have to stay and endure. We all have our sensitivities, and when you think you are joking about someone, you might, not always, but you might, actually be hitting a sensitive spot. It is your right to think that your coworker is being too sensitive. But if you keep doing it, you are still being a bully. Something else, and it will be the last terrible point of this talk, do not put all your eggs in one basket. Most people in this room already have their passion and their job in the same place. You love video games and you work in video games. So try and put everything else outside of the video game area. As great as it is to get along with your coworkers, keep up the friendship you have outside work and keep up the friendships you have outside video game development too. Sure, when you are crunching, it is nearly impossible. There is only so much you can do. But do not spend all your mega leisure time playing video games. You have to, it's a monitoring work that you have to do, but seek other pleasures. Books and movies and social activities can enrich your work too. And this way, I wish you this day never happens, but you never know. When things go ugly at work, you will still have other things that work in your life. And you will be a little less miserable. And that's the whole point of this talk. So thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, or if you want to share your own not-so-terrible tips, please do. Thank you.